Hey guys, welcome back to my two-part series on wildlife photography settings. I'm Janine and I would like to help you get your camera ready for your next wildlife adventure. This is a two-part series and in my first video I touched on the basic camera setup mentioning the five most important settings including focusing, metering, your frame rate, white balance and picture style. In this video, we will dive right into your ideal wildlife settings, regardless of the shooting mode you choose. I will summarize the exposure triangle for you, tell you what to prioritize in wildlife photography, provide you with some go-to settings and give you hints and tips on how to avoid wildlife photography pitfalls. These videos will share all the little details that I wish someone would have told me from the start. The exposure triangle. Many people enjoy photography and have a great artistic eye, but all the settings and numbers keep them from exploring photography from a more creative side. If you understand the exposure triangle, it becomes easy to play with the light, explore the stories that wildlife tells us, and capture it not just as a memory shot, but as actual art that captures the viewer's attention. That is when we start with real photography and give those animals the stage they deserve. I believe that the exposure triangle becomes the downfall of many photographers because light seems like such an abstract concept. We can't touch it, we have forgotten how to really see it and therefore struggle with measuring it. In this video, I will use a few tangible metaphors to show you that it is not much different from other things we can actually grasp and measure and it will all start making sense. First and foremost, we must understand that light is not much different from paint on a canvas. We require a certain quantity of it to paint and finish our picture. It is the same with photography. We require a certain quantity of light on our sensor to finish our photograph. The exposure compensation is essentially the measuring cup that will quantify how much light we have or rather want for a specific image. If you overexpose an image, you basically tell the camera you require more light for your image. And if you underexpose, you require less. That seems pretty straightforward, but how does the light really get there? We have three different settings in a camera that could basically be considered as the gateway for the light to our photograph that will determine how much light can be collected. Please bear with me as it will make more sense once we start applying the theory in our wildlife priorities and I will give you a super simple approach with the wildlife go-to settings later. Number one, the shutter speed. The shutter is literally a curtain within our camera that opens and closes similarly to a curtain in a theater that moves vertically up and down. The speed at which it moves is recorded in seconds or rather split seconds. While the curtain stands open, light can enter into the camera. However, at any given point that the light changes while the curtain is open, which essentially happens every time an animal moves, it is recorded as a soft, blurry and fuzzy line. This is what we call motion blur. Summed up, if we choose to collect large quantities of light by letting the shutter stand open long, we allow for time to pass, which makes it more likely that something moves, which then results in a blurry picture. Number two, the aperture. The aperture is simply the size to which your lens can open. You could compare it to the size of our pupils that open and close as the light changes. The aperture is measured in so-called f-stops, which work entirely counterintuitive. The smaller the f number, the wider our lens opens, and the larger the number, the smaller the lens opens. It does have a mathematical explanation, which I won't bore you with in this video. Obviously, we can collect more light at once the wider our lens stands open. 
However, just like the motion blur for our shutter, we have a side effect for our aperture. The lower our f-stop and the more light we collect, the shallower is our depth of field in the image. This can be quite nice as we create a nice separation between our subject and our backdrop, therefore placing the entire attention onto our animal. Or it can be rather annoying as we struggle to get two animals interacting in focus at the same time. Whether it is of advantage or disadvantage, you will need to keep it in mind for your creative process. Lastly, we have the ISO, formerly known as ASO in our film days. This is the most difficult light parameter to explain as it is not as tangible or physical as the other two. It is essentially your sensor sensitivity and the larger your ISO becomes, the easier your camera picks up on light. While it really doesn't let more light into your camera as such, it can make the light that entered your camera more or less powerful. As you could already imagine, increasing your light might have a side effect once again. The more powerful you let the light be on your sensor, the more grain you will have visible in your image, which affects the clarity of your photograph. So all three of these light parameters or gateways do not simply just let light into your camera, but also have a creative effect on your picture from motion blur and clarity to depth of field to grain. So not just do you need to make sure that your measurement cup gets the exact quantity of light to paint your image, but you also have to ensure that you use the desired combination of light parameters in order to create a certain look to your image. This is where the creativity kicks in. How to balance those three, I like to visualize with a water tab and a measurement bucket instead of a triangle. Let's say we want to cook and we need an exact quantity of water. If we cooked a larger quantity, we would require more water, which would essentially be the same as overexposing and the other way around. Your shutter speed is pretty much equivalent to your tap. The longer you leave the tap open, the more water can flow. The aperture is equivalent to the size of your pipe coming out of the wall. The larger the pipe, the more water comes out at once. That in turn allows you to open and close the tab very quickly and still collect a large quantity of water. If your pipe was only the size of a needle, you would really need to wait a while until you, let's say, collect one liter of water, requiring the tap to stand open long. You get the drift. Last but not least, we have the water pressure. The water pressure is essentially the light intensity around us and we can boost it with our ISO. Because the ISO can make the light appear more or less powerful. So if we have a high water pressure due to a combination of great light or high ISO, we neither need to have the tap open long nor do we need an awfully large pipe to collect sufficient amount of water. This might seem like a strange comparison, but I have found that making light tangible allows people to understand the correlation between shutter, aperture and ISO much better. So to finish this train of thought, if you would like to underexpose, one of the three things or a combination of them must happen. Either you need to take light away by fastening your shutter, or you need to get a smaller aperture by choosing a larger f-stop or you need a lower ISO. In turn, if you require more light, the opposite needs to take place. This might now seem both logical but also really complicated to apply in the field, so we will now break it down and make it super simple for you. If our video content helps you in your photography journey, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel by pressing this bell button and never miss a video again. Priority in wildlife photography. Our absolute priority in wildlife photography is to achieve a fast shutter speed. 
There are two reasons for that. Number one, our top goal is to attempt to capture great stories in wildlife behavior. This usually entails moving animals that do not like to sit still until we are finished capturing them. So we need to make sure that our shutter speed is faster than their movement to capture and literally freeze the moment in time. If you would like to learn more about intentional slow motion shots, please check out Charles' video above. Secondly, we tend to shoot on tele lenses that allow us to get relatively close to the action. However, every single movement we do is enhanced by multitude the longer your lens. The new mirrorless cameras have a fantastic body and lens image stabilization. However, we still need to account for our own shake and movement. With an older setup, I like to apply the rule of thumb to never shoot slower than double your focal length. So if you shoot a 500mm lens, you need to acquire a minimal shutter speed of one thousandth of a second, even for a still standing animal portrait. With the new camera setup, we can shoot a bit slower than that. But why risk it if we have enough light? Anything under your focal length will decrease the chances of a sharp image. It is not impossible, but much less likely. To give you a bit of a better idea of what shutter speeds are required in wildlife photography, slow moving and larger mammals can usually be photographed at 1250th of a second. As soon as there is pouncing, bouncing or playfulness involved, you want to be at least at 1600th of a second. From two thousandths of a second, you start freezing water as well as running animals. And from 2,500s, you'll be able to capture 90% of the larger birds in flight. However, bee eaters, hummingbirds and kingfishers need to be shot much faster than that if you want them in flight. So to be able to acquire such fast shutter speeds and sharp photographs in turn, we need to compromise and let the light in through the other two remaining gateways, which is the aperture and the ISO. They now need to work so much harder that we can get the required amount of light onto our canvas. Our second priority is then the aperture. Fortunately, it is our intention to place the attention onto the animal. Try and say that 10 times. The better the background blurs out, the less the viewer gets to distract from our storytelling. That requires a shallow depth of field, which is equivalent to a small f-stop and a wide aperture. Essentially, it means that our goal to create a shallow depth of field aligns with our goal to have to let a lot of light into the camera to compromise for the fast shutter. Lucky us. To give you a better idea regarding your aperture, f8 is equivalent to a human's perception of depth of field at 16 meters. I like to call f8 the I don't care if stop, as it is no different than what we see with our own eye for the most part. Wildlife photographs that stand out to us are usually shot at a lower f-stop as the shallow depth of field is what draws our attention to the animal. A blurry background, so-called bouquet, is basically what places the animal into the spotlight. If you would like to learn more about how to create a beautiful bouquet, check out Danielle's video about backgrounds. Our last light parameter the ISO is not so much of a priority. While no one really likes it, some people unfortunately obsess about it, as it does create noise. It is a means to an end, or maybe for some people a necessary evil, as it is simply there to supplement the remaining quantity of light needed to achieve the required exposure. Therefore, we first choose a shutter, which allows some light in. We then choose an aperture, which allows some more in, and then the ISO simply fills the remaining gap of light we require. The only time this approach does not work is if we are lacking enough light to start off with so that our ISO becomes so high that the noise levels become unacceptable. 
Every camera has its own threshold on how far the ISO can be pushed. If you reach that threshold or come close to it, you will have to start compromising first on your aperture and last, because it is priority, on your shutter. At the end, regardless of what creative effects we would like, we always need enough light on our sensor. My wildlife go-to settings. Well done everybody for sticking with me and twisting your brains in a knot. Back to basics now with those three go-to settings for wildlife photography. I personally prefer shooting on manual with automatic ISO, but the settings will apply to any of the other shooting modes as well. If you would like to learn more about why we at Pangolin choose that specific shooting mode, please check out Sabina's video. Setting number one, our status quo. First of all, we require a status quo camera setting that allows us to pick up our camera at any given time and get a fast safety shot without having to think about our settings, wasting time and missing the opportunity. This is the setting I will return to after each and every subject, so I know I'm ready for the unexpected. So when do we usually not have time to think about our photograph? That is, if we are getting surprised by something moving extremely fast. That means we will need a fast shutter to freeze the movement. 2,500 of a second should freeze most bird life, water splashes and running animals. Whenever we get startled, we'll also probably not be very accurate with our focus regardless of whether we are talking about eye tracking or a single point. Therefore, a larger depth of field, let's say f8 and higher, might provide us with a required error margin in case we're not spot on. Lastly, I like to be on an exposure of zero, as we never know what we might encounter and in which light it might be. If it is very overcast, you might want to overexpose a little, as most animals will look darkish. Now I'm fully aware that those settings require a reasonable amount of light. So if you operate in a dark environment and your ISO has met its threshold, you have to start compromising and see how close you can get to these suggestions. Remember, the first thing you compromise on will be your ISO and aperture, as it is more important to have a sharp shot than a shot with a large depth of field or less noise. Setting number two, action shots and interaction. Essentially, our status quo settings come close to action shot settings, as it is those scenarios that usually get us flabbergasted, frantic and inaccurate. However, if you have a moment, you might want to double check that your animal does not move any faster than 2,500 of a second. If you shoot fast moving action, you might want to go as fast as 4,000 of a second. You might also want to double check your aperture and save some light by reducing your f-stop if your animal happens to be far away. That is because your depth of field automatically increases the further your animals away from you. In that scenario, there is no need to steal light by closing down your aperture. Setting number three, portrait shot. Lastly, a portrait shot should usually give you enough time to quickly reconsider your settings. It is usually a slower moving animal so that you can drop your shutter speed to around a thousandth of a second then it is our intention to create the most pleasing look, which usually includes a soft background. Therefore, you would want to drop your f-stop as low as your lens allows. If you are able to reach an f2.8, just be a little bit careful, as your depth of field will become incredibly small and your accuracy has to be spot on. Some people prefer a larger depth of field on larger mammals to ensure that the head is in focus from nose to ear. However, I do enjoy a softer look with the eyes being entirely in focus and the rest of the detail blurring out. I really hope these three settings give you a good starting point. Essentially, you need to ask yourself the following three questions 
every single time you approach an animal. First, exposure. Is my animal darker or brighter than my background? Please check out my part one of this series to get more information on that. Second, your shutter. How fast is my animal moving? And third, your aperture. What depth of field do I require? Lastly, check whether your ISO can even sustain the choices you have made. After all, beggars cannot be choosers and if there is not enough light, it will be our first priority to collect enough light over and above the nice creative side effects we could or would want to have potentially. Wildlife photography pitfalls. Excellent! We have now broken down our wildlife photography settings in detail. While it was very theoretical and you might feel a bit overwhelmed, the only way to gain confidence is to go out into the field and use it. It is literally like a language. That being said, I would like to give you a heads up about the three most common pitfalls that I encounter with people when choosing their wildlife photography settings. Slow shutter on aperture priority. Because the big M on a camera intimidates a lot of people, or they're simply used to it from way back when a lot of wildlife photographers shot that way, a lot of photographers shoot on aperture priority. That means you choose your aperture and ISO and the camera will allow for enough light on your photograph by automatically choosing the shutter for you. That basically means that you have to control the most important setting, your shutter, via constantly adjusting the ISO. While a bit cumbersome, it is possible. Something I have seen happen many times, however, is that a photographer might choose the correct ISO to attain a fast enough shutter, but when the action takes place, the frame might darken. Let's say because the hippo comes charging closer and falls out the photograph. The only way the camera can maintain the correct quantity of light in the dark frame is by letting the shutter stand open longer now. That in turn always leads to a slow shutter and a blurry picture. Especially with action shots that do not happen all the time, by the way, this is a very frustrating and very sad experience. Therefore, watch your shutter like a fox when you shoot on aperture priority or simply do not allow for it to be automatic in the first place. Dark exposures on manual with auto ISO. If you are someone shooting on manual with automatic ISO, you might now feel very reassured However, even here, there is moments when the photographer gets excited and stops paying attention to important settings. If you limit your maximum ISO so that it doesn't go too high by accident, you might run into your ISO threshold. This means that your camera cannot automatically allow for enough light on your sensor anymore, as your ISO has been handcuffed, basically. The camera indicates this by showing that your exposure or meter is running off to the minus side. A minor detail that is very, very easily overlooked. In turn, you end up getting very dark exposures, paired with very high ISOs. If you try and fix this in post-production by lifting your exposure or pulling out your shadows, this will lead to an unbearable amount of noise. Therefore, please watch your ISO like a fox when you shoot on manual with automatic ISO. Lack of bouquet on shutter priority. Last but not least, you might want to save yourself some work, effort and brain juice by simply controlling the shutter only and letting the camera do the rest. It will definitely seem like the easy way out. However, you will give up any control of your aperture. Yes, I might have said that it is not as important as your shutter, but it is a very essential part of creating a pleasing looking image. If you shoot in a lot of bright environments, your F will automatically now close down and create a massive amount of detail in your backdrop that takes away the attention from your animal. Definitely something that is all right in a memory shot. After all, our smartphones and GoPros also have a large depth of field. 
but when you want to start with beautiful artwork as wildlife photography, it becomes a real problem. Well guys, you have made it successfully through my two-part series on settings for wildlife photography for beginners. I hope it helped you wrap your head around the topic. Please check out the first part if you haven't seen it yet. If this seems too much to tackle on your own, why don't you check out a pangolin photo safari where we will practice all the above in the field together. I would love to welcome you here soon. Cheers!